اسمي أيمن مهنا مدير التنفيذي لمؤسسة سمير قصير مركز سكايز للحريات الإعلامية والثقافية برحب فيكم بلقائنا بعنوان الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان في العصر الرقمي يلي هو ضمن برنامج Tech for Freedom تكنولوجيا من أجل الحرية اللي من نفسه بالشراكة مع منظمة اليونسكو بدي أشكر أولا جامعة الأيو بي ومركز ومعهد عصام فارس للسياسات العامة والعلاقات الدولية لشراكتهم واستضافتهم لهاللقاء هيدا تاني مرة منتعاون وبنتمنى أن تكون مش بس المرة الثانية رح يكون في مرات كتيرة لهالتعاون يمكن يلي بيعرف مؤسسة سمير قصير بيعرف أنه هي مؤسسة مختصة بالدفاع عن الحريات كانت الإعلامية والثقافية بس الدفاع عن الحريات اليوم عام 2017 ما عاد بقى بقى يختصر يقتصر على التحديات اللي كانوا يواجهوها الصحفيين والمثقفين من عشر سنين الاعتقالات مستمرة والخطف مستمر والقتل مستمر بس هي مش بس هاي الاعتداءات على حرية الصحافة على حرية التعبير بالعصر الرقمي صار في أشياء جديدة مرتبطة بدخول لخصوصية العالم لخصوصية الناس دخول للداتا تبعهم من قبل حكومات أو من قبل شركات خاصة لحد ما صار فينا نقول أن نحن عايشين اليوم بعالم ما بعد الخصوصية يلي بتعيد النظر بكتير أشياء بالنسبة لنا بتعيد النظر بشو يعني أنا أكون حر لأنه الحرية وقدرتي على الاحتفاظ بأمور خاصة وبأمور سرية كانوا متلازمين بين بعضهم هل العالم عم يتغير؟ شركات تأمين على السيارات بتقولكم إذا أنتم مستعدين تحطوا تطبيق على التليفون تبعكم نحن عاملينه أو تحطوا علبة صغيرة بالسيارة بتعمل حساب لأنتم كيف عم بتسوقوا هل عم بتسوقوا بسرعة كتير هل عم بتقربوا على السيارات التانية اللي قدامكم هل عم تسرعوا كتير بالكواع هل عم تلتزموا بالضوء الأحمر كل هال... هالآب اللي عندكم إياها فيها تسجل كل هالأشياء بتقولكم إذا أنتم التزمتوا بقوانين السير سنة الجاي بوليس التأمين رح تكون أرخص بكتير وإذا ما التزمتوا بأنون السير أو ما حطيتوا هاي الآب رح تدفعوا أكتر شو بنعمل نحن كناس هل منوضع هل منلتزم بهال اقتراح من هالشركة ومنحطها أو لا شو بيعني هالشي لسرية تحركاتنا أو يمكن ما تكون سرية بس إنه قدرتنا إنه نزور ناس ما كان بدنا نخبر إنه نحن عم نزورهم أو نروح لأماكن ما كنا نخبر قبل أنه عم نزوره هل أنا بدي أعيش يومياً أنه حياتي الخاصة كلها محطوطة للعلن؟ سؤال كبير وما له جواب سهل لأنه كمان عدد كبير منا خاصة موجودين إحنا بحق الجامعة حياتهم الخاصة حياتهم الحميمة هي كمان عم تستخدم قسم كتير كبير من الأدوات التكنولوجية بلا ما نكون عارفين بالضبط أنه المعلومات اللي نحن عم ندخلها بتطبيقات وين موجودة حاليا مين عنده إياها مين عنده إمكانية الوصول لإلها هاي العلاقة بحياتنا الخاصة بس بالسياسة هالشي شو بيعني اليوم البيانات في أحزاب سياسية تشتريها حتى تعرف نحن شو منحب شو الأشياء اللي بتهمنا وين المحلات يلي منروح عليها وفيها ساعة تغير طريقة الحملات الانتخابية بالنسبة للحملات السابقة وهالشي عم بيطبق يوميا بغياب أي نص قانوني بيلحظ كيفية استخدام هذه البيانات مثلا فترة الانتخابات العلاقة ب بأي طريقة نحن عايشين على مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي ضمن فقاعات يعني الناس اللي عندها موقف مشترك بتحب دونالد ترامب ما بتحكي إلا مع بعضها ناس اللي موقف السياسة بلبنان مع رئيس الجمهورية أغلبيتها بتحكي مع بعضها ضد حزب معين بضل تحكي مع بعضها وإمكانية تواصل بين ناس من مجموعات فكرية مختلفة عم بتصير أقل رغم أنه نحن عايشين بعالم أكثر اتصالا فالشي كمان بعيد النظر بأي طريقة الناس بتكون أفكار السياسية فإذا كيف بتكون أفكار عن الحريات عن حقوق الإنسان وعن الديمقراطية فبهالإطار حبينا نوسع الحديث وناخد أمثلة عملية من تجارب دولية حاولت تعمل مواقمة إيجابية بين التكنولوجيا الحديثة والتنمية وحقوق الإنسان والعمل الديمقراطي والعمل السياسي كيف فيها 
التكنولوجيا تساعد كمان بمكافحة الإرهاب وقتها بنعرف إنه عدد كثير كبير من المجموعات التي تصنف إرهابية وفعلا تنكون كثير واضحين اليوم حديثنا منه عن تصنيف الإرهاب بس كيف المجموعات يلي فيها تتوسل للعنف كوسيلة لتحقيق أهدافها السياسية كمان فيها تستفيد من اختراعات التكنولوجية فنحن شو دورنا بالتعامل معها كل هيد الأحاديث رح تكون اليوم موضع العروض اللي رح يقدموها زملاء برحب فيهم بلبنان حسب تسلسل اللي رح يقدموا فيه العرض كلوديا فاغنر من مؤسسة ICT for Peace اللي هي مؤسسة سويسرية بس كمان عندها مكاتب ببريطانيا جازم حليوي من ال... من تونس يلي هو من ألمع الشخصيات العربية بعالم الداتا بعالم البيانات وبأي طريقة من خلال البيانات فينا نفهم توجهات وتصرفات المجتمع بأي منطقة استخدمنا فيها الأدوات يلي جازم أطلقها ويونا كاتشوك من هولندا رغم أنه شركته أو مؤسسته موجودة بدولة جورجيا يلي كمان كيف فينا نستخدم البيانات وعلاقتها مع الخرائط حتى نقدر نبلغ عن مشاكل عن انتهاكات بيتعرضوا للعالم حتى نقدر نحصل لهم حياتهم بناء للأمثلة اللي راح يعطوها راح نفتح الحديث وبتمنى يكون شيك وبشكركم كتير على حضوركم معنا فمثل ما ذكرت راح نبدأ مع كلوديا بعرضة فيها تختار أنها تكون إما وقفة أو جلسة حرية كاملة لأنا <تصفيق> Well, thank you, Eman, for a really interesting introduction. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Claudia Wagner. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to you today about our project called Tech Against Terrorism. Um, it is a project which, obviously, uh, the issue of terrorist and extremist content online is an issue that affects us all, no matter where we are in the world. And our project is here to work with tech companies to empower them so that they have to give them operational support so they can deal with terrorist and extremist content on their platform to know what to do with this content and also give them the power to help them protect freedom of speech and privacy of the internet and technology. So just to give you a quick... So uh, just to give you an idea of who we are, we are... So Tech Against Terrorism is a UN Security Council mandated project. We work closely with UN We're also working closely with big tech companies such as Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and Twitter, um, and a lot of small tech companies we're really working with, including Just Faced It and Um, I'm going to back up slightly and tell you about phase one of our project. Phase, we're currently in phase two, but to give you an example, uh, sort of a background of the project. So last year, uh, so last year, 2016, we were carrying out workshops all around the world in Kuala Lumpur, Zurich, and in. We were carrying out workshops in three cities around the world and trying to answer four questions. The first one was, how are terrorists using technology? The second one was, what are the challenges for companies in dealing with this content? Uh, the third one was, which stakeholders are involved in dealing with the issue between terrorism and technology? And how can we bring more people in? And the third one was, OK, so the challenges of tech companies. What are the operational support that they need from the UN to help them in dealing with this content? Um, so at these company uh, at these workshops, we brought in uh, these companies, um, these government and international government government bodies. Um, these were also brought in civil society and human rights defenders, and we brought in leading experts from think tanks and academia to talk about this. And from these three, four meetings, we had these four three meetings. We had these four conclusions. The first one was that in dealing with ter uh, terrorist content and technology there was very little being talked about the respect for rights. So the need to, in coming up with ways of dealing with um, content, such as like content date down, very little was being done to ensure, to bring in, to ensure that we kept freedom of speech as, a, as something that was vitally part of the internet. 
The second one was that in coming up with solutions to deal with it, very little was actually being driven by facts. A lot of it was just, um, there was no data behind exactly how terrorists were using it, which could then inform the solutions that we were coming up with. The third one was this researchers looking into how terrorists use technology kept emphasizing the fact that although sure there is an online dimension to it right now, a large amount of the use uh, of terrorists and how they operate, radicalize and uh, recruit people is still happening offline and this was a vital part that we need to keep thinking about and you know coming up with solutions towards. And finally what really affects how our project is in phase two was that Big tech companies such as Twitter and Google have been coming up with solutions to how to deal with it since the early 2000s and a bit later. However, smaller tech companies just don't have the same capabilities in-house to deal with this as Twitter, Facebook. You know, they're not big companies. Often they're a one-man show and these were the people and whose platforms were really being exploited by terrorists. So as part of that as well, sort of looking at the, the balance between big tech companies and small tech companies, we were seeing that um, since about 2010, big tech companies were really beginning to come up with industry-led regulations on how to deal with this. So this was sort of standards that they were pushing forward, driving forward of how to really make sure that tech companies were dealing with this, being... Um, being aware and transparent about it with their users and also with governments. And this is what we're calling in our project the Emerging Normative Framework. And it's based on three pillars. The first one is terms of service. So how do you say in your community guidelines to users what content you allow and what content you won't allow? The second one is content moderation or content takedown. How do you, are you transparent, you know, how do you, how do you tell your moderator, say if it, working at Facebook, what content you allow? on your platform and what to do with content that seems to be of a terrorist nature. Um, how are you also engaging with government agencies or law enforcement? And the final one is transparency. How are you being transparent by how much content you're taking down because a law enforcement agency has asked you to do it? Or how are you telling your users if, uh, how are you being transparent with them if one of their content is taken down, why it was taken down and what, what part of it was actually um, not correct with their terms of service? And from this, we're really, why we think our tech, our project is really focusing on driving forward this emerging normative framework. Because A, it complements traditional regulation globally. And this third, uh, the other reason is because it's, it's effective and it will adapt with time. So it will adapt with social norms, it will adapt with market forces and techn technical architecture. Technology is vastly, you know, developing and we need to make sure that the solutions we're coming up are going to keep evolving as these techno uh, technologies evolve as well. Um, so, and as part of this, it's not only ensuring that tech companies abide, you know, or uh, agree and move forward with this emerging normative framework, it's ensuring that everyone who's part of this dilemma of how to deal with terrorist use of technology is also part of the dialogue. And that's how we see our project really spearheading, is bringing everyone involved into the into the dialogue and having the ability for, say, civil society and academia to speak with smaller tech companies at the same time as, rather than just big government speaking with big tech companies, also bringing in these other two. But in our project, we're really focusing on this small green area, the green area at the bottom, which is all the different types of tech companies we are focusing on in the phase two of our project. I'll speak more about this a bit later. Um, so as part of this, sort of bringing everyone into the discussion, we've also now part and worked in collaborating with the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. This was set up by Facebook, YouTube, Google, uh, no, sorry, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Microsoft earlier this year. And it's them really, sp their, their way of spearheading what, we, what they think is really important, which is passing on best practices from big tech companies and passing on this knowledge to small tech companies. And as part of this, we're focusing on the knowledge sharing platform and facilitation. So both, um, you know, bringing all the stakeholders from the last slide, bring them together in conferences so they can talk about all these issues and come up with innovative ways of dealing with them. Also doing outreach in the tech sector, so building a community between different tech companies where they feel comfortable and trust each other so they can share the issues they're facing and so they can learn from one another. 
Um, also, coming up with um, tools that will operational support that they can implement. So, coming up with frameworks for terms of service and transparency reports and uh, different tools for dealing with content. And finally, come up with innovative ways of counter speech. Content takedown isn't the only solution to deal with content. We've got to come up with different ways of sort of dealing with the terrorist propaganda and countering it. Um, so as part of this, and the reason why we're in Beirut is today we'll, uh, tomorrow we'll be holding a workshop with small tech companies. And that's to bring them into the room to carry out needs assessments workshops. So we understand for them what are their challenges, what do they find, you know, what have they been using so far, what resources do they use, what do they need from us. So at the moment that's our current phase of it. So we're doing workshops uh, in the cities around the world between now and November where we'll be carrying out needs assessments with uh, small tech companies to really understand from them what their operational challenges are. We'll then, be carry, we'll then be using all this data to then create tools which will be launched in around November. So there'll be tools for um, creating terms of service, so to making sure that in your community guidelines you're telling your, what content you allow um, on your platform and what you won't. Transparency reports, so you're really transparent with both civil society, with governments, with your users, of what you are doing to deal with terrorist content and um, to what extent you're, you are working with law enforcement and other different government agencies. Um, and finally, so as part of it, um, the tech companies that sign up who go through the first two stages of our uh, platform will then get a trust mark. And this will be like a badge of honor. And they'll be able to say to their users, look, we know we have terrorist content on our platform, or we might get it. We have done as much as we can to deal with it. And it will, they will then form an elite club uh, group of companies that have really you know, faced the challenges that we face nowadays and are doing something to drive, to make sure that you know, we prevent terrorists and extremists from becoming more and more operational. Um, so you might ask, well, you say tech companies, who are you talking about? So these are the tech, so from our phase one research, we found that these are the tech companies that are most at risk presently from being used by terrorists, both to recruit people, to radicalize, and also to carry out um, uh, operations. However, we realize, you know, times are changing, we need to keep up with it. So we've also identified future threats. So things like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, which we know might not currently be being used by terrorists, but within the next two years or so, could be at risk. So, some of you might have heard of other similar schemes and you're wondering why would a tech company join Tech Against Terrorism? Well first, we are one of the only bodies which are trying to form a community between different bringing all these different stakeholders in, but also building a community between tech companies located in regions, uh, in regions all around the world. And we want to build a network where people will be able to learn from each other both best practices and worst practices. We think this area of knowledge sharing is going to be the most effective in driving effective solutions to counter these problems. Second, we're actually, we are building, we are using data to come up with these solutions. We have the evidence of how terrorists are using these platforms. And we're going to use these, and having, spoken, having carried out these workshops around the world, we'll also know from tech companies themselves what is happening. And we'll then be able to use effective solutions that will drive down the popularity of uh, terrorists and extremists on these platforms. Um, we're also providing actual tools for companies to deal with them. These won't just be like a sign up and you can, you can say that you're part of this scheme. We'll be giving them actual tools that they can use to implement that will help th these companies um, yeah, be part of, um, these companies drive it. So um, I really encourage any of you, if you know any tech companies that would like to come to our workshop tomorrow or who'd like to be part of, um, who would like to be part of this project, I very much recommend you, you know, encourage you to come up to me at the end of this session or to contact us on our website, which is uh, just there, and we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. We'll definitely have uh, time for follow-up questions, but first, uh, let's listen to Jasm's presentation from Tunisia. Yes, how does it go? You just click forward and click Good one. Yes, this one. 
<coughs> Hi everyone. Uh, so, we're ready. Okay. So uh, I'm going to share a little bit of uh, what uh, we do at Web Radar, uh, specifically to uh, in the field of media and journalism. So uh, I'm starting with this question: uh, Can we analyze public opinion in real time? So 2017, the world has changed a lot and is still changing. Everybody uses social media to consume information and to share opinions and uh, ideas. So it's a very fast word. So the traditional way of uh, understanding public opinion is through surveys, through uh, questions that are asked to a sample number of people. And it takes a lot of time. It, it is hard to set up, especially in regions or in several countries. Uh, and most importantly, it fails to capture the unconscious nature of emotions which is the main driver of behavior. So we, you might want to think that the world is uh, an organized place with rules and laws, but reality is very different and uh, you see very unpredictable way of uh, how people behave. And psychology tells us that human behavior is driven by emotions. And usually those emotions are uh, hard for people to capture around themselves. So when asked specific questions about any topic, people tend to forget, tend to uh, hide their true, uh, their true opinion on, on some topic. And uh, this, makes, uh, th this might make a huge bias in the, in the results of the survey. So an, a way to tackle this problem is to do this work on using how online population uh, feels and thinks about topics. And we can do that thanks to the uh, explosion of social media on the internet. So you might look at the population as this big uh, blue circle, and the online population is this growing uh, circle in the middle. And the online population sample is just a part of it. It needs to be big enough so that it uh, might represent or be representative of, of what people think and feel about any topic. So how does it work? Uh, at WebRadar we develop technology that uh, uses this methodology to capture uh, in real time how do people think and feel about any topic. So th these are the technical steps that are necessary uh, for the software to uh, to be able to do this complex uh, result. So the first thing, the first step is zoning and sourcing. And this means that we take a country, let's say Lebanon, and uh, the first step is to, uh, to find the, the parameter, the online parameter of the information circulation. Meaning, who produces information online and where is it consumed? So basically, uh, we'll find uh, dozens or hundreds of uh, mainstream uh, news sources, online newspapers, etc. But we'll also find tens of thousands and sometimes millions of Facebook pages, uh, open groups on Facebook, uh, Twitter accounts, public Twitter accounts, blogs, forums, websites, etc. So this first step allows us to put the, the spotlight on the public production of information in the country. The second step is uh, to continuously monitor those sources uh, like any search engine does. So we crawl the content in real time uh, using uh, crawlers, spiders, web spiders, etc. And for social media we use the, uh, the APIs, the, the systems uh, offered by uh, Facebook and Twitter and such, uh, such uh, social media websites. The third step is collecting the content and uh, store in it in order to analyze it. So content uh, come in different forms. So we have lots of texts, but also pictures, videos, etc. Uh, we started at WebRadar by analyzing the language, the text. Uh, so the first thing we do is we clean the content to remove all the banners, the advertising items in, the, in a given page. And this then allows us at the fifth step 
to dig into the content itself, to the language, to the sentences, to the words, and to extract meaning from them. So in this phase, we uh, put a special focus on extracting the emotions associated with the meaning. So let's say, we, we'll have an example at, the, at, the, at another slide. The sixth step is to measure, to make these things measurable. Meaning, uh, if you want to know how, how, many, how much people talk about a specific topic in Lebanon, we need to put a place of it. Uh, so, is it 10% of people aware of the topic? Is it 80%? Is it 1%? So, we do this, um, we do these estimations and measurements uh, by combining uh, demographic uh, uh, numbers and figures about the country, but also uh, mathematical modeling, uh, uh, including how many people like the item, how many people commented on it, how many people shared it or retweeted, etc., circulated it. And we also combine these numbers with the uh, audience metrics of different websites and, uh, and news sources. So, uh, I'm skipping those slides because maybe they're too technical. So these are more explanations of the different steps that we have been describing. Uh, and the most important things here in the content analysis is the sentiment analysis and connecting people's emotions to, to specific topics. And by topics I mean uh, uh, ideas, um, people names, places, events, brands, products, movies, anything that has a name. Uh, so if you look at this example for, for instance, uh, you can see here that the software will uh, extract different uh, concepts from the, this tweet. Uh, so uh, the software is able to uh, recognize the word love in I love Michelle Obama uh, and assign uh, a positive sign to the whole tweet. So this is a very simple example, of course. But the, the main idea is the computer is able to uh, simulate human reasoning and human understanding to calculate or to measure the score, uh, the emotional score of, of uh, a text. Uh, is it positive, negative or neutral? And then to dig into that emotion and try to uh, describe it. What kind of emotion is it? Is it love? Is it happiness? Is it anger? Is it sadness, etc.? So all of these are technical things. So uh, we started this uh, technology in Tunisia back in 2013, and we went mainstream uh, in 2014, reaching customers like uh, World Bank, like uh, governmental institutions in Tunisia and elsewhere. Uh, US, UK government has been customers uh, using our studies and our analysis to understand what's going on in the region. Uh, but also brands and private companies that want to understand how do people think and feel about their products and services. So th the data we're we were able to collect, and that's old figures back uh, two years ago, it's millions and hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of uh, data items that allow us to extract those, um, this map of uh, people emotions regarding any topic. So a, a quick comparison here uh, about Tunisia and Egypt. We were able back in 2015 to extract this sample data and this allowed us, for example, in Tunisia, we'll, we'll see it here, to predict the, the outcome of the elections before the vote. So the data is so, um, is so powerful that it actually predicts what, how people will behave. And in the uh, example of the Tunisian elections, presidential elections, we uh, applied our uh, method to predict the outcome of the election and uh, successfully predicted uh, the outcome with a very, very tiny margin of error. And that was better than two of the uh, top three uh, polling agencies at the time. And also it was before the vote. We, uh, we we did this again in the uh, French election 2017, by the way. So a couple years ago, we wanted to put this technology in the hands of the media in Tunisia and other countries. And after the revolution, 
and you might uh, have a, different, uh, a similar situation here in Lebanon, the uh, media la landscape has been shifting from uh, government-funded uh, uh, media companies to uh, private and small uh, new initiatives. And many media organizations have struggled to survive in the changing landscape of uh, digitalization of content. Uh, many died. And those who survived in Tunisia and other uh, Arab countries typically succeeded in making this the, the, the change from traditional media to uh, digital, uh, creating Facebook pages and Twitter accounts and YouTube channels and pushing their content uh, continuously there and uh, having moderation with and uh, uh, interactions with their readers. So, uh, two years ago, uh, we uh, cooperated with the uh, French uh, media cooperation agency, CFI, uh, which was funded by the European Union to create an online platform for journalists, we called Webticar, uh, in order to put this technology in the hands of journalists, which were not able to, to pay for this kind of technologies, because those new media companies were very uh, fragile economically. They depended heavily on their uh, <coughs> advertisers and ha didn't have the financial capacity to uh, invest in those new technologies. So this platform uh, was aiming to uh, introduce the concepts of data journalism to uh, Tunisian uh, journalism, journalists as well as uh, other media professionals in North Africa, Algeria and Morocco to be specific and also Egypt. Uh, and we also uh, wanted those people interested by this uh, platform to be uh, hosted in a physical space. So we chose to uh, host them in a co-working space uh, to uh, not only to uh, to do the technical shift in how they uh, operate and do their work but also to physically uh, be in a, in a new kind of uh, workspace. So uh, th they had access to uh, sophisticated tools that help, help them do investigative journalism, <coughs> data visualizations, uh, analysis of public opinion on real time, etc., which they could report on. Uh, this is uh, my colleague and I are presenting this uh, platform uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, an audience of uh, media professionals. Uh, this is an example of how the, the data could be used in a mainstream online newspaper. So uh, here the, uh, well it's, uh, it's funny that it's related to Lebanon, uh, even though it's, uh, it's an old one. So how much uh, Tunisian reacted to some news back in 2015 I guess, uh, 16, that was last year. and. Uh, I, I think that was uh, Hezbollah mentioned in some news and it, it created a, a huge buzz in Tunisia which typically doesn't follow mm -hmm. topics of around Lebanon and it was interesting for Al Huffington Post which is the uh, Maghreb version of uh, Al the famous blog to, uh, to report on that. So 4% of Tunisians reacted on, on Facebook around this specific event that was actually a declaration done by one of the government officials around Hezbollah. Uh, the, these are other examples of, uh, of other uh, newspapers in Tunisia using the data from uh, the Webticar platform. So in this example, for an activist uh, is using the, uh, the data from Web, Web, Webticar to analyze the uh, strategy of different uh, international uh, multilateral organizations or politicians, uh, analyzing their strategy and how they how they create a specific image uh, on the uh, with the public opinion. So we also partnered with uh, national TV and radios and other uh, popular uh, newspapers. So th that's the uh, Tunisian experience and we were uh, also hoping to export this experience which was uh, 
very rich in, uh, in, in new learnings for us and for uh, media professionals to other countries. So uh, we set up the program in Algeria and in Morocco. And hopefully, uh, if uh, some of you are interested by our work for Lebanon or other neighboring countries, I'll be very happy to discuss that with you uh, through the questions or later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jazim. We move to Jona, who, uh, as I mentioned, is Dutch, but based in the Caucasus in Georgia. It's very interesting uh, also to know why you chose that place and um, <coughs> also how Elva's work fits in the discussion Thanks. today. Cheers. Good afternoon. My name is Jonne and I'm the director of um, Elva Community Engagement. And we have built an online platform that allows people to track human rights violations or other issues of concern. And we started building this platform a number of years ago in Georgia, the country, where following the war with Russia, um, we built a platform to allow people to track um, security incidents in their communities. And that project went so well that um, we actually kept working on it and we've now implemented projects with it in um, about 15 different countries uh, on different continents. And the organizing uh, team of today asked me if I wanted to share some lessons learned. So I basically thought if I could go back in time for about five years to the moment that I founded Elva, what are the five key tips that I would have given myself that would have made my work a lot easier? And so I've, I've collected those uh, and I will share them with you. Um, before we do that, however, I will very briefly show you the platform itself so that you have uh, a general idea of what it looks like in practice. And to do that, I will, um, I will briefly show you two live websites. So this is a project that we did a number of years ago in the Central African Republic. Um, you'll see here that um, this is a project where, um, where people were reporting human rights violations throughout the country. And the concept is pretty simple. As you can see, um, different uh, types of human rights violations have been reported. Each of them have a different color. If I click on one of those bubbles, I'll see, uh, I'll see an accompanying text that explains me what this violation is about. And I can see exactly what violations took place where, but also when. So if I scroll uh, through this timeline, I can basically track the spread, the geographic spread of incidents over time quite easily. And then below that, we have a number of articles um, with, um, uh, accompanied by photos and a number of graphs that will show trends in different types of incidents. So this is one platform we, we built. Uh, this is a more recent one that actually um, provides also real-time information on transitional justice issues on Aceh in Indonesia. And so, as you can see, the main purpose of this platform is to make it very easy to, uh, to collect and share information on issues of concern, and then to allow people to work directly with um, relevant organizations or authorities to resolve these issues. And um, through implementing similar projects in uh, a wide range of countries, uh, we've collected a few lessons learned. And um, through trial and error, uh, we've had to learn some of these lessons the hard way. So um, I've collected five of them. And um, the first one is get the offline components right before you go online with your project. So often when we talk about technology, people are really excited about the tools, which is very understandable. Um, but as uh, somebody said earlier today, um, 
the magic has to come from you. Um, it doesn't come from the tools. Without a strong offline network of reporters, um, the technology means absolutely nothing. So we invest a lot of time in working with uh, local communities. As you can see on this slide, um, there's a few examples of, 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 of citizen reporters that we worked with over the past few years in Georgia. And you can see that uh, they have different ages, both male and female, um, different parts of the country. And what we try to do is two things. First of all, we build uh, trust with them. So we go and see them regularly, um, and that's very important because we're asking them to report potentially sensitive information, so they need to be able to trust us with that information. Um, another thing that we, that's very important to do is to uh, make sure that each person that participates understands how his or her personal contribution um, uh, um, benefits themselves or their community. So what we see with the far majority of online citizen engagement projects is that they fail. And that is because after a number of weeks or months, a certain fatigue sets in with reporters because they feel disenfranchised. They don't understand why they should uh, keep investing in this project. So we meet them often to explain them how their participation has helped, um, has helped to resolve the issues that they've reported. Now, Secondly, uh, second tip is keep the windows open. And uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, a friend of mine was recently doing a human rights uh, project on Cuba. And he met with the director of one of the most uh, successful human rights organizations there. And as you might imagine, their work there is relatively complicated. So he asked this guy, um, what is the key to your success? And this guy said, we, we do all meetings with the windows wide open. He said, anyone who's in the street will, and who will walk by will be able to follow what we're talking about. Um, because he said, of course, we have to be careful um, with sharing some kinds of information, but we uh, try our best to avoid unnecessary secrecy. Um, he said um, that, um, of course, when you're working on human rights, um, a lot of topics that we discuss are sensitive, but if it becomes your habit to become secretive about everything, there's a great risk uh, that we create misunderstandings and that we also generate unnecessary suspicion of what we do. So whenever possible, try and be as open about who you are, what you do, and why you're doing it, uh, and how you're doing it. Um, a second advantage of that is also that sometimes support might come from uh, unexpected quarters. So on some of the human rights projects that we've worked on, uh, or our partner organizations, we would uh, suddenly uh, notice that people from um, people uh, from city hall or local authorities would suddenly start helping us out simply because we had, um, we had taken the effort to go and see them, uh, to explain who we are, what we're doing, and how it could benefit them. So keep the windows open as much as possible. Um, Another thing that uh, we've had to learn, I think, the hard way is that a lot of projects uh, don't optimally use sort of positive language to promote behavior change. So we often find ourselves in a uh, find ourselves in a position that we have to convince authorities to work with us or convince international organizations to work with us to address certain types of issues. Um, and I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, we're currently supporting an organization in Iran um, that is setting up a project that allows citizens to report um, problems in their street, uh, small infrastructural problems like potholes or uh, problems with, uh, with uh, the sewage. And um, this is not at all a unique project. There have been dozens of projects like these. But again, the majority of those have failed. And one of the reasons is that very often these projects adopt a language that revolves around um, sort of commanding language, like they're called uh, repair my street. And then if with that language and that frame you approach uh, someone at City Hall, they are often already incredibly busy, they have enough work to do, and then you come and approach them with yet another task on their list. And as a result, uh, they're often less inclined to work with you. So what we try to do is we try to first of all understand what is it that we can do for those people whose support we need, 
that will make them look great. And so uh, for this particular project, we've approached um, the local authorities and we've said, look, this project uh, is going to be about improving the city together. And if we can do this successfully together, this will uh, create uh, great PR for you uh, and will strengthen your support uh, among your constituents. And so that approach has proven uh, way more successful. Now, this is one of my um, favorite ones. It's, it's prepare for trouble. Uh, if you're in the business of defending human rights, you very often find yourself questioning uh, vested interests, which means that there's friction and trouble is, 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 is heading your way. Uh, I would even go as far as to say that if you don't get in trouble, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> so, um, and um, the projects that prove most successful are often the ones led by people who anticipate trouble, but also who have the patience to sit through it. Um, and I can give you a recent example. Um, a few weeks ago, I was, um, I was working on a project, and uh, I, will not, I will not say now which one it was, but I was working in a, um, on a project uh, where we needed to meet with a certain part of the military to ask permission to go into a certain area. And I went to this meeting with a few of my partner organizations and uh, across the table from me uh, was a guy, um, uh, a guy from the, uh, who was representing the army. And um, already when I came in, I had a sort of a fairly bad feeling about his, his, his attitude. And um, so I gave a presentation of the project and um, as soon as I was done, this guy starts like tearing into me and starts saying, this project is terrible. Um, he called uh, uh, my organization and my partner organizations uh, uh, propagandists, etc., all things that were blatantly untrue. And um, the conversation got so heated that you know, after about half an hour of heated back and forth, my, my voice had gotten hoarse. So we get out of the meeting and my partner organizations are saying this, this was really bad. Uh, we're not sure about how this, what this means for the project, but it's not looking good. Um, and, but, but based on my experience, I was saying exactly the opposite. I was, saying, I was saying the fact that there's so much pushback probably means that we're onto something here. It probably means that there's something that we're doing right here if people get so emotional about it. And so we kept talking with different people and indeed a few weeks later, we found out that the guy um, who'd basically been attacking us uh, was involved in a fairly large corruption scheme and that he was afraid that our project would expose this uh, corruption scheme. And we then later got the support from his boss to still go, go on with the project. So just, this is just to say that sometimes having the patience to get through the hard bits um, really, um, really works. And then um, the last one is fairly simple. Um, we invest a lot in, uh, in developing our own code. And there might be people uh, amongst you who are also setting up their own tech-driven human rights projects. Um, and when you build your code yourself, it's a bit like your, your baby and you, you sort of, you, you've taken care of it. And sometimes it's a bit hard to let somebody else babysit your baby for a while. But sometimes that's, that's actually a very healthy thing to do. Uh, at least once a year, we try to have an external auditing company do a full security audit of our code. So if you take data um, uh, security seriously, please have this done. Like we've been working on our code for years. We had a full security audit just a few months ago. And even after four or five years, sometimes really embarrassing little mistakes um, come uh, appear on the surface that um, could have been easily um, uh, avoided, but that could also have been exploited by um, people wanting to sabotage our projects. So those are the top five things that I would have told my past self uh, five years ago. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, this is my email address for anyone who wants to get in touch. I've also listed there the URL of our new um, free platform for uh, tracking human rights and, uh, and other uh, issues of concern. Um, this is the beta version, so feel free to try it out and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jonna.
I'll uh, have a um, couple of questions to the panelists before we open it to the public. Uh, uh, Claudia, first, can you give us a couple of examples, mm -hmm. practical examples, of how terrorist organizations, uh, crime groups have misused or abused apps or technology that initially was seen as a very uh, positive one to support their activities. So it was a Practical examples. Yes, like an application that everybody loved that was nice, that was not designed necessarily for any misbehavior that was actually abused oh, by um, terrorist groups. I get better at this microphone thing. Um, sure, I mean, there are a number of technology that we use every day that are used by, um, say, ISIS. Um, WhatsApp groups, they're very keen on them. Um, they will regularly use them because they're encrypted, so it's harder for the government authorities to be able to track them. Um, they shift also between different tech. So WhatsApp is kind of their favorite one to use um, as it's harder for law enforcement to follow them. Um, they will also, um, since WhatsApp has been really cracking down on, um, on you know, terrorist use and quite good at closing down groups, um, they've also shifted over to Telegram, which I think all of you kind of know has been the, you know, the rookie one of uh, <laughs> messaging apps. And for that, that's really interesting because uh, there's both closed groups and there's, and there's also channels. So channels are an easy way for them to um, pass on their propaganda. So they have a series of different channels where um, they'll have somebody who's in, you know, different people who are in charge of their propaganda. And every day they'll have a new poster, you know, or a new little gift that they'll send out. And then these will be decimated across all these channels. And then they'll also have these private groups where only better people will be able to come in. Um, they also regularly use anything we use nowadays, like Twitter. I mean, they've, Twitter's really clamped down, but that was really popular for them, particularly around, I think, 2013, 14, it was really popular with them. But they, they then had to shift off, and they realized, so in comparison to other um, terrorist groups, such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS was really, um, saw the benefit of Twitter and be able to make it a global thing because anyone could access it. And the moment they were kicked off that, it was quite a, a huge thing for their propaganda in that they had to go back to more, what they saw as more arch archaic w ways of really decimating their propaganda. But yeah. Sorry to be blunt, yeah. but these are expected answers in the sense that uh, messaging apps yeah. and apps that were actually designed to voice opinions are of course used yeah. by everyone. But do you have examples of groups using dating apps or apps related to exchanging, I don't know, um, uh, recipes or things that are not necessarily designed for messaging but that have a messaging component that were misused? Actually, it was really interesting when you look at um, the recent uh, attacks in um, Charlottesville in Virginia, yeah. um, how they were trying to, um, Airbnb was <coughs> actually ahead of the game with all the others in that they were able to monitor um, people from store, uh, from people from the people on the daily store, daily store, right? On their community guide, uh, on their comment section, people were organizing where they were going to, um, how to organize these, this march they were planning. And Airbnb was actually able to pick up on the fact that they were organizing it, was then able to find, they'd already booked accommodation on the platform, and they then looked ban these, they, from the, the, the information they were monitoring on the Daily Stormer, they were able to ban these users from using the platform before okay. they even arrived. And now as a freedom of expression organization, my question is, or if I imagine some people here from the anti-cyber crime office at the Lebanese Internal Security Forces, yeah. or people from general security or intelligence forces anywhere in the world, or police forces, their direct inclination would be great so in order to preserve the safety of citizens, let's have access to that. Meaning, let's have access to each one of us. Let's have access to every person's messaging with everyone else, because this is the inclination of security forces. Mm -hmm. So what kind of convincing answer do you have saying that, yes, we need to be smart and cooperate with Airbnb and mm -hmm. all these other uh, groups without revealing where people who want to escape from very 
socially conservative norms can meet their loved ones and things that are related to our personal freedoms mm -hmm. that we cherish so much. We fought so hard over the last few years to gain some liberty and now we're seeing the whole world saying, well, in fact, maybe these liberties are a luxury and let's go back to a more under control version of the world. What's our answer? <laughs> well, first, um, closing down anything isn't going to work. Uh, look how many apps are created every day. You close down Twitter, something else will pop up. There's no way that you can keep people, people like us, creating a new app and know, not know that whether that app is going to be taken, you know, used by an extremist or terrorist or not. If you're going to use that solution, you'd have to cut down called, uh, all forms of creating new technology. Um, that's what the Turkish government thinks is okay, that's what the Iranians and the Chinese and the Saudis think is okay, or the Emiratis when it comes to a lot of the messaging platforms. What, to close down everything and then we'll yeah. just like have a day-to-day -day dialogue. I mean, it's not how the work works anymore. If the Turkish, if the Turkish want to trade like they do with the world, they need to adopt more creative solutions and that's, you know, trading with the world. You can't do that through normal ways, you need to do that through new technology. So you can't, you know, you can't fund your country and then not ex and then expect to not have conversations with everyone around the world. I think we'll have more questions about how yeah. to organize. <laughs> but I'll move to Jazem and ask you for um, uh, how do you adapt your tool to Arabic, actually? Because I'll give you some examples. We're at the... Isam Faris Institute. So it's an event organized by Isam Faris Institute and Samir Kassir Foundation. If I turn this into Arabic, I would say, Mahad Isam Faris wa muassasat Samir Kassir. The word wa and word muassasa don't have a space between them if we want to write correctly in Arabic. For most, you know, uh, word processing platforms, Wa muassasa is a word, and muassasa is a different word. And muassasati is a yet different word, which is a very particular thing to Arabic with all the suffixes and prefixes attached to words. How practically does it work? And I'll add up the issue related to dialects, given that a lot of people, when they want to express their feelings and opinions, use their dialect rather than... Uh, literary Arabic. So how does your platform deal with this? I think tons of information more than what it would have been in, uh, in French or English. Yeah, sure. So let's start with the first part. So uh, the same way you are able to understand that wa muassasat something is, is what it is, is you have a brain and you have a memory of passwords, you know that muassasa is a word and wa is a, uh, has a function in connecting two words together, etc. And you make some reasoning and uh, actually your brain uh, uh, does a lot of calculations unconsciously allowing you to disambiguate meaning, different potential meanings of, of, of the sound of a word. So we try to emulate or simulate this kind of work using machine learning, uh, which is basically uh, a way of teaching the computer uh, the way we teach a baby. Uh, uh, we, we show the, the computer different uh, things and, uh, which are right, and then we start showing him unknown things, and uh, from his memory he, uh, he is able with more or less accuracy to uh, to classify or to categorize something new into something already known. Uh, of course, we uh, supplement that with uh, dictionaries uh, that have uh, definitions and synonyms and acronyms, etc. Uh, and, and it's actually this field of uh, natural language processing is uh, actually booming. Uh, and there are lots of uh, unsolved problems in, in this field. Um, one of the, uh, the, the problems we face is uh, how to decode or decrypt sarcasm. Uh, so for, for this kind of software uh, in the future we need uh, to, have, uh, to be able to uh, put a word or a sentence in its context uh, sometimes uh, not only the context, context of a paragraph or of an article but the context of a, of a whole culture and a whole epoch. Uh, 
uh, more and more words are created today, including in Lebanese dialect or any other dialect. Uh, words are popping up in cultures. Uh, so we're, uh, we need also to be able to uh, detect those new words and to understand them and uh, to uh, follow their uh, evolution in the public mindset or public mind. Uh, so it's a lot of software with statistics and uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, we do lots of uh, manual uh, coherence checking still. Uh, uh, and we, in, in the case of web radar, we focused at the, uh, on the local dialects in the Arab region. So Tunisians don't speak Arabic, they speak Tunisian. Moroccan don't speak Arabic, they speak Moroccan. As we, and Lebanese don't speak Arabic, they speak Lebanese. Uh, so of course we support English, French, etc., and Arabic languages, but we uh, definitely support local languages which are used by people to express themselves and opinions. And for this, uh, we need uh, expertise in each dialect. Uh, for the day we will launch uh, Web Radar in Lebanon, we would need uh, s someone who fully understands Lebanese. Yeah. Uh, maybe there are variants in, Le in Lebanon, maybe there are the southern or the northern yeah. Lebanese, etc. Uh, so we need people who uh, are able to uh, uh, to teach the computer what, uh, what Lebanese is. Um, we, we also use, we, we also discover the dictionaries of each dialect by, by using the power of computers. So uh, when we deal with a new language uh, at WebRadar, we uh, typically start collecting content, uh, conversa public conversation on social media in that dialect or language. And uh, we are then able, without any understanding of the language, uh, to uh, guess what are the words of this language, uh, what are the most common words, uh, how they are used, uh, and sometimes we can even automatically uh, capture their meaning without even understanding the language or the alphabet of the language, just because people mix different languages and uh, sometimes they, uh, uh, they might uh, put a translation of a word or of a name uh, in uh, two different languages. So it's uh, astonishing how you can learn about uh, language without understanding the language. Mm -hmm. But then uh, we definitely also need uh, local expertise in doing so. As someone who has in the future, maybe near future, maybe far future political aspirations, I'm scared actually by what you do for two reasons. First one is if I don't have the money to buy your technology, I mean much richer candidates, but at the same time really bad, bad, bad candidates, really bad candidates, might have the money to actually uh, buy that technology and have a huge advantage over me. But more specifically here, I want to be elected because of my ability to push new ideas, not because of my ability to just cater to what today's needs and trends among the population are. If that's the case, if we win elections just based on what's today popular, well, it truly impoverishes politics as the, the field of values and uh, aspirations. What's your answer to this? So two questions in, yes, in one. Yes, the money and the aspirations. So I, I guess you are right to be afraid. Uh, it, it fear in this case is uh, legitimate because uh, as any powerful technology, uh, when put in the wrong hands, it, it m might lead to very bad results. So uh, let's be cautious in, uh, in these technologies. So you won't sell it to anyone? Do you have your red lines about who can of buy course your technology? Not. Of course not. Like, uh, behind the technologies, we are people, we are humans, and uh, uh, this kind of ventures and companies and startups and technology are... Uh, not just to make money. Of course, we want to be uh, wealthy enough to live comfortably. We want to contribute to the community. But uh, basically, we, wanna, we, we all want to, to have a good life, uh, not necessarily controlling others. Uh, we don't want to be controlled. So why, uh, why tend to control others if we can live together peacefully? Uh, so this is, of course, not our um, strategy to, to sell to the, the strongest and the, uh, the unfair uh, organizations, let's say, of the world. Uh, 
um, to the contrary, we want to help the, uh, the less privileged, uh, and that's why we uh, design programs that, like uh, the one I showed earlier. Um, regarding your political aspirations, Ayman, uh, I, uh, I, I don't necessarily see, um, see uh, the connection of, uh, what, of, of, with the technology. Uh, of course, you want to introduce uh, new ideas uh, that might change the world uh, or your community to the better. Uh, and for this, uh, you might want to understand your communi community better. What do they like? What do they think? What are their beliefs? Uh, what kind of beliefs you want, you want to change? And what kind of arguments uh, are the winning ones uh, to, to help you change the wrong beliefs? Yeah, I hope you'll sponsor my campaign. And uh, Yona, um, so you mentioned about the fatigue of citizen reporters. You ask them to report on human rights when they don't see something necessarily happening or, or improving their lives. But it would work if the authorities actually are willing to do what's right for their community. So you have to also get the buy-in of the community. If I take other examples in many African countries, Burundi today, Syria here, uh, when the authorities actually don't want to improve the situation, reporting becomes such a frustrating thing, thing to do. There is no war in the world with more reporting on actual violations than Syria. And then what? Uh, that's a very good point, uh, uh, and I fully agree with that, because um, we, out of principle, don't take on any projects where we haven't established in advance that there's a high likelihood that the data will actually be used to make a difference. Because if we just collect information and then just let it sit on a shelf, then we're achieving exactly the opposite of what we want to achieve. Namely, we create a gap between ourselves and citizens who actually want to help out. We sort of exploit their energy um, for a project that eventually will not give anything mm -hmm. back to those communities. So that's a very good point. Um, then, so for example, what is your uh, piece of advice to all the human rights defenders who are um, taking, who are reporting on Assad's violation, ISIS's violation, violation of every other fighting group? What can they do practically with the data they've collected so that one day it helps for something? Uh, that depends, I think, on the individual uh, situation. But again, if I would not recommend eliciting feedback from uh, a larger population, so from regular mm -hmm. citizens, unless you can give something back, unless they feel that they're getting at least as much out of it as they're investing in it. Mm -hmm. So in cases where, um, where, where the problem is very uh, protracted, and where uh, solutions or an effective response are less likely, I would always favor an approach where uh, semi-trained and potentially paid reporters do a lot of the work. Okay. Because that, for, uh, to begin with, that gives you more, uh, that gives you more control and it, give, it, it also helps you to understand who exactly is reporting the sensitive information to you. So you, there's a mutual um, a bond of trust there. Uh, and secondly, it also, if, especially if you pay them, it also means that people will keep reporting over a longer period of time. And finally, it's a question for you, but I think all the others can answer it. Um, in order to keep the data that we collect, because there is also the always data collection, safe, yeah. how much should new tech companies or NGOs that are collecting data invest in, as you mentioned, you conduct audits, but actually building relatively secure platforms that get this data. Can we rely on the cloud only? What to actually do to make sure that it's less likely attacked? Well, look, I'm, um, if, you're, uh, if you're an NGO, um, you, you need to think, I think, about who potentially might want that data. Yeah. Because if you think that that's, um, that, that's a government, yeah. then it will be very hard to protect your data. Uh, most NGOs just have limited resources. They can't afford the type of premium security that, um, that, that, that wealthier companies or organizations uh, might be able to, to use. Um, so we are very conscious of what data we collect and where we keep it. Um, fortunately, for most of our projects, we, um, we, we can work with 
um, uh, with existing services that provide a lot of basic security. Um, we, out of principle, don't do projects where we feel that there's a, that there's a high likelihood that information, le potentially leaked information, could harm. directly harm individual uh, respondents. Okay. And I think that every NGO should probably adopt that, 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 that policy, because if a certain uh, uh, entity wants to get access to, uh, to your data and really tries, and I'm talking of government uh, services here, they probably could. Thank you. It was a real reality check. Uh, question time open for the public. Uh, I think there will be microphones. Can you just confirm that? Yes, microphone with our colleague here. Sir, uh, fifth row. Can you please introduce yourself before uh, asking the question? And please, let's make sure we're asking questions and not making statements. أولا بدي أشكر المحاضرين يعني على هذه التوضيحات الرائعة. بدي أشكر المحاضرين على هذه التوضيحات الرائعة بالحقيقة. العنوان مثير. اسم الكريم بس. دكتور علي يونس. لعنوان مثير جدا يعني الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان في العصر الرقمي ولكن يعني فكرتين طرحتهم أستاذ مهنا إنه الإمكانيات المادية المتوفرة هي بتسيطر على كل شيء يعني هل تستطيع شركاتكم أن تؤمن حماية أسرار الدولة والشعوب بهالبيانات اللي بدكم توفروها أنتم ما تتجسس أمريكا وطلعتها قبل ما يعرفوا فيها وزارة الدولة بزيتهم يعني اليوم نحن عايشين بعصر بنسميه عصر العولم الليبرالي اللي بدأ مع مع ريغن وتاتشر واللي سمح بامتصاص كل ثروات العالم وكبة لتغطية عجز الميزانيات التجارية الأمريكية وغيرها يعني يمكن يكون الاتفاق الجديد بين ترامب ورئيسة وزراء بريطانيا الجديدة ماي شوي خففت من هذه الغلوائية نحو الدولة القومية الحمائية وسلب العالم بطريقة أنه نحن الأقوى ونحن بدنا نحافظ على حقوق دولتنا إن كان بفرنسا صارت بأمريكا صارت ببريطانيا صارت ويمكن لحق يلحقها بعض الدول الغربية شكرا بس بدي أقول هل تستطيعون تأمين الحماية حماية بياناتكم في أي دولة ما من التجسس للدول الكبرى علينا شكرا شكرا جازم في ال في في وضع ويب ريدر مثلا احنا اخترنا ان بنشتغل اكسكلوزيفلي على المعطيات المتاحه او المفتوحه او الاوبن بابليك انفورميشن فما عندناش اسرار يعني كل اللي بنعمله هو بنجمع الببليك كونفرسيشنز والمقالات والتعاليق المتاحه اصل على الانترنت ف في ان اور كيس There is no secret. بالعكس احنا دورنا ان بنجمع كل هذه الحوارات والنقاشات وبنلخصها وبنحللها وهدفنا انه تعود للببليك يعني تعود للببليك وللجميع المتدخلين في الشأن العام والمؤسسات الخاصة الى اخره ما فيش اسرار وفيما يخص المنظمات المجتمع المدني أغلبيتها مش مؤتمنة على أسرار الناس مش مؤتمنة على أسرار الشعب هو المفروض أنه تكون الحكومات هي التي مؤتمنة على حماية أسرار والمعطيات الشخصية لشعوبها في الحالة التونسية مثلا بعد ثورة 2011 تم تغيير الدستور لضمان حاجتين نفاذ المواطن للمعلومات أي معلومة تمتلكها الدولة باستثناء المعلومات التي تخص الأمن الوطني 
وكذلك يعني تعهد الدولة بحماية المعطيات الشخصية لأنه الدولة قادرة لو أرادت التجسس على على شعوبها والتسلط عليهم فكان من الضروري إدراج هذه هذا الفصل في في الدستور وبعد متابعته بقوانين لحماية معطيات شخصية المواطنين وإلا فيسهل التغول على نموذج المخابرات التي تصبح هي التي تأخذ القرار وتسيطر على الشأن السياسي والاجتماعي والاقتصادي. شكرا. Do you want to weigh in on this question? Sure. Yeah. No. So I forgot to mention it in my presentation actually that phase three of our project is building an online portal for better tech companies. I'll get two. Maybe they'll catch my voice. Um, where they will be providing an alert service for them to really hunt, um, to to so they they can see clearly where there is content of extremist and terrorist nature on their platform and then give them the tools um, so they can make the decision for themselves as to whether this should be removed or do uh, remain or create some sort of counter narrative um, and I agree for that 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 was one of our main concerns when we first started building this project was that this could this tool could be misused by anyone whether who were able to get their hands on it so I echo um, your your suggestions that anyone who's working with data of any sort needs to ensure that before you even begin collecting the data that you um, that you have the protection in place not only for uh, DDoS attacks um, but also for any form of hacking as well. Um, and I agree also with the limited financial resources of um, of anyone w away from um, developed countries, particularly like Europe and the US, which is why A, our portal will be free. And this is to encourage as many tech companies around the world to really to become come on board and join this community. Um, more established ones based in Europe clearly have the finances to sort of deal with this, but we're really looking at smaller ones based in, you know, Indonesia and in countries like Beirut to help them really protect themselves, their platform um, from both terrorists and extremists, but also from any form where their data might be breached. Um, and this is also why one of the reasons why we're holding these workshops around the world is to really bring in the community, not only because this is an, an issue that only affects countries in Europe or in the US it is one that affects countries around the world. Um, so we all need to be involved in, you know, dealing with the solution to this problem. You know, or we can, I think we can move. Yeah. Sadali. Hi, I'm Federica Marci, I'm a journalist with the Daily Star newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask the two last speakers, because Ms. Wagner made it clear already, um, whether your projects have also um, a link to Lebanon, whether you're planning on taking them to Lebanon, to Lebanon or whether you simply have a message that the Lebanese public could um, you know, um, take advantage of. We're currently um, not supporting or running any projects in Lebanon, um, but the concept itself is very flexible. It can be applied to many different themes and many different contexts. So um, as, as I've discussed earlier today, before the public session, um, we're, we're happy to support anyone who'd like um, to put it to use here. We've just released um, a free version, free beta version of our latest, um, of our latest uh, platform. And um, so we, we'd love to test it here. As for WebRadar, um, are hopeful to launch in Lebanon and Jordan uh, beginning in 2018. So if you're interested in any aspect of this uh, presence here, please uh, let me know. Thank you. Very last row, fourth person, then very first row. Uh, first, I would like to thank the speakers and the organizer. Uh, my name is Abdullah Rafiq from Yemen. Uh, I'm an independent writer. Uh, I would like to ask the speakers a, any effective tips for Yemeni activists to document more about the war crimes and the violations of the civil war in Yemen because this is limited to uh, Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch and 
a couple of tweets, and that's not adequate for such catastrophe that's happening now in Yemen. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, the primary question to ask would be is who, who would you like to report? So theoretically, you could ask regular citizens to report on things that they're experiencing or things they've witnessed. But that then subsequently also poses other questions about how you can secure um, their safety while they're reporting on this. So we have uh, implemented projects in a number of fairly difficult contexts. Um, Libya comes to mind, Syria as well. Um, but in most of these places, we've worked with semi-trained uh, reporters for the reasons um, that I just mentioned. Because we felt it's easier, they're more aware of potential safety concerns, so they can give sort of informed consent when they um, uh, work uh, to report these issues. And secondly, um, because it also allows us to better verify the information that's coming in. Um, I, on, on a separate note, I don't think that any initiatives would necessarily have to be done outside of existing organizations like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty. I think that if one uh, would approach these organizations, they might actually be interested in exploring um, projects that are maybe not within their traditional mandate, but that complement what they're doing. So. Um, Looking at many other examples around the world, I do think that there is a space for the type of project that you just described. I, I do think that citizens or semi-trained reporters could play a role in, in indeed shedding more light on what is happening in the more remote and hard to access areas of, uh, of Yemen. Thank you. Well, first, I better say that I'm not speaking as a Human Rights Definitely. Watch employee. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it depends on what kind of attention you want to bring, whether it's on the hardships of the people living there or whether you want to be monitoring what's happening because there isn't a body who's monitoring, I guess, the daily human rights abuses that are happening in the country. Um, I'd say if it was um, sort of bringing attention to the rest of the world about what it's like to be in Yemen right now, photos are always grab people's attention and stories of people as well. Um, but as you mentioned, there's also like the danger of being on the ground doing that. So definitely recommend you know using a very encrypted kind of um, forms of sharing information like WhatsApp and ensuring you're doing the two-step um, identification, identification and anything like that. Um, yeah, Thank you. Uh, I might oh, add, sure, add a point. Even though I'm not a human rights activist or an NGO, uh, if you want uh, uh, to stop the abuses, uh, well, it depends on what your goal is. But if you want to, the abuses to be stopped, one direction you might consider, in my opinion, and I'm basing my reasoning on common sense here, is to target the abuser it's himself. Or. So if it's a country that is abusing uh, people in, uh, in, in your country, uh, one way to uh, stop the abuser is to make him realize his own atrocities. And this might come from his own uh, conscious people uh, media, influent, influent personalities, etc. Uh, people will stop when they are pressured from the outside or when they realize from the inside. And that path is uh, often, in my opinion, too much ignored and I, I thought it was uh, worth sharing. Thank you. Jisma. Actually, I, I have two questions, if that's okay. Uh, one's for Yona. And your name, please. Uh, oh, sorry, um, my name's Philippa Neve. I work um, in electoral assistance uh, for UNDP. Usually, not always. Um, Yana, are you familiar with uh, an, an organization called Ushahidi? Because this was set up many years ago to monitor uh, electoral-related violations, electoral-related violence in Africa. And it's spread quite widely, and it seemed to be very effective. And it seems to be doing a very similar thing to what you're doing. So I'm just wondering how much networking or how much crossover you could achieve with them in, you know, in order not to do duplication, which we all often do. So that was the question for you. Maybe ask your second question. And the second question was for Claudia, which is uh, that 
you're uh, talking about uh, tracing and, and tracking um, terrorist-related content on, on websites. Is there some uh, way that you can actually go upstream and find out where it's actually physically coming from? Or is that a function that you would then hand over to security uh, agencies? <coughs> how does that work? Because just taking content down is great, but how about tracking the people who are actually putting the content up? Thank you. We're, um, we're definitely familiar with Ushahidi. We actually think that they're doing fantastic work. Um, when we started developing our own, um, our own platform, which was basically end of 2010, early 2011, they already existed because, if I'm not mistaken, they exist since 2008. And they, they were doing fantastic work by then. Uh, one of the reasons why, in the end, we decided to develop something in-house was that um, especially for that time, the type or type of data collection was um, uh, was was uh, was slightly more complex. So Ushahidi at the time uh, provided the opportunity to share sort of brief incident reports, but um, what it what it didn't allow um, reporters to do was to submit um, structured quantitative and qualitative data. So with our platform, what we try to do is to allow people to report on a wide range of both quantitative and qualitative indicators so that we can track also problems over time. Um, we've done that in Georgia, for instance, for a bit over three and a half years with our longest running project. And that wouldn't allow us to establish trends and to carry out some basic early warnings. So if we can, for instance, see that in a certain week there are five shellings which is sort of common for that time of the year, or for that location, and suddenly we see in the next week that that number is, uh, is increasing to 10 or to 15. That might be, um, uh, it might be the case that there's a sort of an, a tipping point, that there's an, an, an escalation point there that we need to look at. And so we were really looking at sort of long-term, also semi-quantitative monitoring of issues so that we have a good baseline that is sort of semi-scientific. Semi um, I do think, if I'm not mistaken, that Ushahidi nowadays does allow also for um, exactly this type of uh, longer, yeah. Um, but so that explains a bit the, the, the background there. And I think that another, another difference is, is that we um, that we, um, especially in our earlier years, uh, focused a lot on, on, on really tailoring to particular sort of conflict-related um, issues that were not always available within their software package. But again, I think Ushahidi is a fantastic solution. It's also freely available and anyone can go to the website and set up their own project. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so tracing... Um, where people are is, is definitely something that's already been done. It's very much in the remit of more law enforcement. So they already work very closely with tech companies. Um, so they will ask for particular data if they find someone who, you know, has been, they know is affiliated to a terrorist, um, terrorist group, and then they will ask tech companies for data about it. And it's up to the tech companies to decide whether it will be something they're willing to pass on or not. Um, we will just be giving them sort of our... Uh, the, the, the aim for our project is just to be able to give the tech companies the knowledge to know when a government approaches them to ask about data, you know, how, how does it go about, what is the process, and for users to use a technology, they want to be able to trust the company. They want to know that their, their data is being looked after. Um, so I think it's very much in the balancing act of working with law enforcement when there is a need to give data over to help them with investigations, but also being very clear with users why content has been taken down, you know, if it's part of an investigation, really communicating with that so that, you know, they, there's that trust between the tech company and the user that continues. Otherwise, we just, you know, come into a state where it's Big Brother, where, you know, one government might want it for a legitimate reason and another government might not. So, you know, just make, ensuring that we keep that balance. Thank you. Please, sir. Hello, uh, Dr. Pierre Haddad. I'm on a research project with George Mason University in Virginia about 
the role of the private sector in the development of public administration, the case of Lebanon. Lebanon. And you could imagine that uh, uh, online solutions and cybersecurity is a major component of, uh, of this research. My question is specific about reducing the margin of error. So I will refer to a discussion with a, uh, a security uh, official from the US government saying that any information you will give me based on a compilation of information has a certain confidence interval, has a certain margin of error. So let's say 95% for you, it might be a success. For us, keeping 5% uh, w at risk of not administering solutions to the population is a big mistake. Imagine having 5% of the US population uh, without security. That's 15 million people out of security. How to reduce the margin of error based on models that, are, that compile information. Uh, Claudia, you were talking about evidence-based mm -hmm. and uh, Jasim, uh, you're collecting the information from social media and we know the problems of facile externality and low engagement. So how to reduce the margin of error to deliver solutions to, well, let me be utopian, 100% of the population. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll specifically ask Jasim to answer because when you mentioned 5%, and I remember very, very clearly the results of the first round of the French election being, I was there myself, the first and the fourth were within 4%. So how can you get it accurate, whereas everything can change, and they were all within 4%? Well, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the long answer might be uh, more work, better algorithms, uh, better cooperation between uh, people who own and collect the data, uh, better models, basically, and uh, better processes. I mean, it's a very complex uh, area here. Uh, the work we do is uh, trying to model what people think and feel about topics, uh, but we uh, use only a, a, a portion of the, uh, of the content out there. Uh, not everybody is online, not everybody expresses themselves. Um, this is in our area, which is uh, which has its own limitations technically in the algorithm, in the API that Facebook and others allow you or do not allow you to collect, uh, even if it's public information, even if it's uh, data by uh, created by its users and should be freely available, but they're not. Um, I mean we probably will never have 100% uh, accuracy of reality uh, online. Uh, even if we uh, have a camera on each of us, even if we uh, have a sensor in each, uh, uh, connected to each object in, uh, in real life, uh, it will be immensely difficult to aggregate all this information, make it available publicly to the to people, to citizens, to decision makers. Uh, the only thing I can see myself and others uh, be doing efficiently is just imp working on more data, more accurate data, faster algorithms, more cooperation between entities who own the data. Thank you. And everybody mentioned earlier, never forget offline. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. One of them has already been booked to Sandy, so get ready for the last question. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm Sandy from Skoon, Lebanese Addiction Center, and my question is for Claudia. Uh, we know that at war times, uh, human rights violations take place. My question is simple. Is that justified, and to what extent is the global war on terror uh, justifies the human rights violations, specifically the invasion of privacy and confidentiality of, of citizens, of people? So is that justified? Through me, uh, an easy one, right? Um, is human rights violations, of course, think about this. Um, look, we live in a time where terrorist attacks happen daily in cities around the world. Just in my country, we've had three in the last couple of months. Um, maybe a few more now. 
Obviously, this creates, you know, an edge of paranoia, um, and governments want short-term solutions to deal with it, which is why they really push for content takedown. It seems like a good idea. You know, you just wipe the content off. Surely, that means fewer people will have issues. But the thing with anything like content takedown, it's not effective. Don't quote me on this, but I think one company said that for every 100 pieces of content they take down, only one of them is of terrorist nature. Which is why we need to come up with ways of solutions of dealing with this, which don't affect, well, which limit the effect on our human, that, that, that um, the effect on our human rights. So we need to come up with ways of dealing with it which don't infringe on our privacy and freedom of speech, which is why we're really pushing for innovative ways of, of, of you know, coming, you know, of diverting from terrorist and extremist content. So for instance, YouTube. Now when you go onto YouTube and if you look too many of ISIS, you know, beheading videos, well now divert you, instead of watching that, it'll be like, why don't you watch all these different series of videos which sort of explain to you what ISIS is, you know, and the different forms of narrative it uses to encourage you to your propaganda. So I think we can come up with ways of dealing with this, which, you know, um, which do, um, you know, which will hopefully in the long term infringe less on our human rights. Um, and I think the second point of this is also being like, in with such a complex issue, we cannot rely on machines totally. Um, and this is something that, you know, GIFCT is the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism is really, you know, is, says is reasonable, is that you can't expect a machine to be able to pick up on exactly what content is actually extremist or not, or terrorist or not. So this is why we still need people to look at the information and be able to vet it with them. Um, for instance, they had a, um, there was, say, uh, one of the companies was showing us this photo they had. And it was 10 men standing up in a row. And, you know, it ha you know, for them, it seemed fine. But then they showed it, and it was, then they located where it was, and it was in India. Um, and then somebody who was from India looked at it, and they were like, no, there was just tiny piece, this, the way that the men were standing, they could see that it was actually men standing up to be executed. So that kind of fine detail, a machine ca is not at this stage able to pick up on it, which is why we need both people and uh, machine learning to deal with this. Thank you. Any last question? Okay, so I have the privilege to ask you the same question, which is describe how we will exercise our right to democracy and freedom rights in general in 15 years in relation with technology. Worst case scenario, so the, the nightmare scenario and the dream scenario, but please let your second example be the one that you think is more likely. So give us the dream scenario, the nightmare scenario, or vice versa. Nightmare and dream, but start with the one you think is less likely. Jonna. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, very, very appreciated uh, this, this great question. Um, I think that the nightmare scenario I see is that, um, that there are so many avenues for citizens to participate that a lot of the more um, renowned and trusted sources of information and uh, that shape our public debate are increasingly being crowded out by sources that are less reliable and that <coughs> confirm um, pre-existing opinions. I mean, I'm not saying anything new here. I think we're all very much aware of this. I don't think we've really formulated a clear answer to that threat yet. Um, and I think any one of us, if we look at our own Facebook pages, probably have about 80, 90 percent of, of people there who just largely agree with us on most issues, which I think is very dangerous because deferring opinions are needed to shape the debate. Um, so I think that's the nightmare scenario is that at some point technology um, drives us apart by creating clusters of people that agree with each other and that don't allow space for people with deferring opinions. Um, I think the, the dream scenario is that, um, as, um, as Claudia also mentioned, we start to understand these processes a little bit better. And so if at some point we see that certain, um, certain unfounded narratives enter the public debate, is that we somehow manage to at least flag them as, as unsupported by, by evidence and that we give preference to new sources that are 
slightly more reliable give preference to also um, uh, um, channels that allow for civic participation that do that are in line with our basic uh, democratic values and I think you know I, I think that that scenario um, that I, I think that we're looking uh, to some we're already looking at some first solutions here so Facebook recently started with um, uh, started with um, um, a strategy to to filter out um, to filter out unverified news sources to prioritize verified news sources so I think that we're we're getting towards a system where technology can help us to pref uh, to give preference to uh, reliable uh, information as compared to uh, unreliable information. So we he here have an optimist and what you mentioned about Facebook, maybe our piece of advice is talk to Jazim in order to better understand Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claudia, same. Um, I guess nightmare solution is, as we were just saying, uh, solution, nightmare, not solution, nightmare, nightmare, is um, you know that we are become too worried about the issue, you know, the dangerous people in the world and all the conflicts that we forget about the necessity for us to uphold, you know, our basic freedoms, freedom of speech, you know, freedom to be of any religion, you know, any of those, um, in the sake of trying to clamp down on something, you know, premeditated. Um, I think our dream is something that we talked about today, which is giving citizens rights to really participate in every form of society to really hold governments accountable, you know, to put forward ideas that they want to governments to work on and to make sure the governments actually fulfill them. I think that would be fantastic. And you're also an optimist because yeah. you chose the dream scenario last. Yeah. Jazim. So you, you asked us to imagine the world in 15 years, right? Sp yeah, exactly. Specifically, yeah. Dem democracy in 15 years in relation with technology. Yes, but that's suppose we have uh, s some picture of the world in, yeah. in, in 2042, 32. So uh, because I believe the world is moving in an exponential uh, way, uh, that uh, kind of change that would happen in the world in the next 15 years would resemble the change that happened in the last 30 years. Uh, so the, the world in 87 was very different from the world today. There was no internet, no telecommunication uh, as we see today, and knowledge and uh, connections between people are extremely different from what we see experience today. So in 15 years uh, in the future, I see a much more uh, uh, connected world and people much more connected, uh, including uh, wirelessly, uh, not necessarily using devices that we use like this, etc., uh, but uh, probably with chips, uh, uh, wi wireless chips, uh, communicating uh, with family, f friends, colleagues, whatever. So the first pessimistic scenario would look like a small minority of the global powers uh, oppressing the uh, the masses, uh, including uh, food control and health control and. Uh, all the science fiction nightmares and uh, in this uh, sad reality uh, human rights would be just a, a privilege for the uh, for the elite uh, trying to to have a consciousness for those uh, uh, horrible uh, masters of the future um, but I believe the world would be much uh, brighter than this and I personally believe that in 15 years uh, the world would probably look more like humanity would have reached a level of progress in its uh, connections with its true self, uh, meaning uh, humanity would uh, access um, uh, a more noble sense of uh, living together, uh, not necessarily through uh, manipulation or control of other humans, but through cooperation, we will uh, probably live in a world of abundance, uh, supported by the machines and the automation of labor. Um, uh, we would be much more rational in allocating resources, and humans would be uh, much more uh, excited by the adventures that are waiting for us uh, in the universe, exploring the universe. Excellent. So, human rights, who cares? <laughs> All...
our three speakers confirmed that we are in the business of hope. Uh, thank you very much, AUB. Thank you very much, our interpreters, my dear colleagues at Samir Kassir Foundation, UNESCO, and uh, we'll keep you posted about our next events. Thank you.